Uh, Amy, do you want to kick this off? I can kick it off. Sorry, there's a little bit of like, I didn't catch actually your second question. Um, but uh, the, the first one in terms of how we've worked with our founders. So, um, I mean, at a high level, there's been so much uncertainty in the last couple of months and then also just going forward. And so I think that is the biggest environment that everyone is is acting in. Um, you know, obviously, you know, COVID has uh, has uh, has decimated parts of the market, um, although not the stock market. And so um, I would say, you know, the first couple of months, um, you know, we had life speed uh, definitely we're in a, in a mindset that we would enter into a recession quite quickly, which did not happen. But um, and and so did a lot of our companies. So the first thing that we did, regardless of whether that ends up happening or or not, is that we worked with our companies to just extend cash runway. You know, out to at least eighteen months. You know, we kind of prescribed at least twenty four months, and and we worked with each one of them to to really like both. You know, kind of reset their operating plans for the year and um, reduce, um, you know, OPEX, both variable and fixed. We, we've created playbooks for them to do that. A lot of them had to actually reduce staff because that is, you know, the biggest expense of a lot of companies So we help them do that. And then also like extend runway via just more capital, whether that is equity or debt um, and walk through them, you know, help them raise both types of capital. Um, and so it was a kind of like an all hands on deck type of, uh, type of, you know, couple of months um, that has, alleviated a bit now now i think it's kind of like okay what's the next chapter look like and a lot of still like continuous uncertainty um and i would say you know there's a spectrum of um of ceo founder uh reaction to covid um some of them and also that that also depends on like you know whether they were a company experiencing um headwind which is most companies or tailwind which is some companies um, and uh, and so you have founders that have been through a few recessions uh, that were that immediately oriented very conservatively and immediately just cut expense um, or like raise a quick round. Um, and then you have other founders that may not, um, you know, whether it's that they hadn't been in a recession previously or just didn't um, still don't believe that this is going to be as deep of a recession. Just being like, I'm planning on growing through this. I'm planning on hiring through this. And um, and that those were a lot longer cycles of conversations we had to to just convince them to to just um increase runway preserve optionality and, and who won those conversations lightspeed or the portfolio company management i mean we're minority <laughs> investors you know so ultimately it is always the founder and ceo's decision i mean sometimes when you have multiple board members all telling them the same thing it's really hard to ignore but you know yep. it's ultimately their decision and martin as far as your portfolio companies um i, I assume uh, some of the founders may have uh, digested the recommendations differently um how, how did you manage to to steer your founders, your uh, portfolio company management teams through this difficult time? And how did you convince them um, to make what you thought were some of the right decisions? Yeah, I mean, I think I would echo, first of all, everything that Amy said was spot on. Uh, and then my biggest observation, and, and maybe getting to the heart of, I think, what you're asking about the when VCs or when investors disagree with management, management disagrees with it, with uh, their investors on the right path. How do you guys figure that out? And I can tell you guys an anecdote about that. Um, but uh, my sense on the the net results of COVID for a lot of startups, especially money losing startups, was that experimentation was actually one of the biggest victims of of Q2 2020, um, where you had a lot of businesses that were going full tilt. And uh, when they realized that the next funding round was um, or that growth that was justifying the burn wasn't going to materialize in the year, most of the, the changes that were made were not kind of cutting into the bone, but they, were, um, they really pulled back on the size and the magnitude of the experiments they were undertaking. So if you were looking to expand in another geo or you were going to experiment with a a field sales model to complement an existing inside sales model, 
Whereas before you were going to hire five reps and put a bunch of BDRs with them, create the pods and go for it. Now, maybe you hired one and kind of dipped your toes in the water and tried to uh, build the model before you, you really invested millions of dollars behind it. And I don't know that that's a terrible thing, by the way, um, because I think there were a lot of companies uh, that were running at full throttle. And I will tell you, um, back to your original question about conflict, there were definitely some on my own personal portfolio where they just didn't think it was going to be that big of a deal in, in late March. Um, they mm -hmm. never, they hadn't been a CEO of a company back in 2008, 2009. They hadn't seen what happens when people stop buying. Uh, and so it's on, it's on us. It's on us as investors to kind of give them the data, right? Help them see around those corners. But Amy's right. It's, it's ultimately their call. Um, and I think a lot of CEOs uh, in, in, in our portfolio, um, when they made those tough decisions, it was painful at the time. And anytime you, you slow down or cut back, it's going to be painful and, and individuals are hurt. So it's, it's, it's a terrible thing. But then you talk to them maybe a week or two later, once some of the, the emotion of it is a little bit um, less acute, that pain. And they're just, they're breathing a little bit of a sigh of relief because mm -hmm. whereas before they just had this incredible pressure to meet really high growth benchmarks, now they could focus on what's working within my business. Like I, I don't need to just focus on adding this much ARR. And if I haven't added it, I'm a failure. They got to focus on efficiency is something we talk a lot more about, but thinking through what sales models work, what marketing channels work. Um, I've just seen that a lot of CEOs are, are kind of breathing a little bit looser than they were uh, before COVID. So if ever there's a silver lining, that's one that we've seen. And Joyce, uh, we've talked about actually pulling back on spend. When mm -hmm. you're advising portfolio companies, th there is the this saying of, cutting too deep when you have less experimentation, especially in the early stage world um, that that might not have an impact immediately, but it certainly can have an impact two, three, four quarters down the road. How are you advising portfolio companies to balance that, to make sure that they're not cutting too deep and in some situations, I'm sure companies didn't have a choice, but for those that did, I think it would be helpful to hear what advice you're uh, providing them. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, a lot of the businesses we work with are going to be a little bit earlier stage than, you know, where Susquehanna and uh, Lightspeed invest. So they're, they're predominantly seed pre-series A type businesses here in Europe, uh, which means they don't have the benefit of economies of scale. You know, they're one to five million dollars in, in ARR. And that does mean that they are dependent on no, not only customers, but also uh, external investors for survival. And so in, in, the, in a market where there is a lot of uncertainty, uh, businesses still need to demonstrate growth, um, albeit probably not the same kind of rates that you were expecting six months ago. Um, but at the same time, you know, investors are kind of, in some cases, reluctant to bridge the company unless uh, there's a clear certainty on how things are gonna look in the second half of this year. So you're almost in this catch-22 situation for, uh, for a lot of companies, if you will, that uh, you need to continue demonstrating um, value creation in the business, which doesn't always necessarily come in the form of top-line revenue. It could be just getting your product out there to you know a broad install base, and, and demonstrating strong product engagement metrics. Um, but ultimately, it's about not cutting back the parts of the business where there is long term, you know, value creation. So if you think about, you know, the, the early customers where you have really where they've really grown with you and you've really grown with them, those are the ones that you really want to keep close to the business and continue um, serving in, in a way that demonstrates the value of the solution that you've developed. Okay, great. Uh, really helpful. Um, so uh, this question's for Amy and, and Martin. Um, look, the, the market appears to be turning around. Uh, Amy, you, you and I had discussed before that some of your portfolio companies, and same with you, Martin, some of your portfolio companies have absolutely crushed it through um, the market volatility. Uh, 
And it, it sounds like you're seeing an increase in um, uh, investment flow now. What would you describe as a hot deal in today's market? And what are the criteria that you look for in investments in today's world? Has it changed from prior to COVID? We got a lot more in the start this time. Okay. Uh, I was actually, I, you know, like everybody's experience is different. So uh, I will caveat that first, but I was just talking with a, with a buddy of mine who's at another growth stage fund. And we were just kind of comparing what the funding environment is right now. And, and here's my, my summary of a long conversation. So I'm sure I'm leaving some details out, but uh, the hottest deals are still trading at the same multiples and still getting done. There has been at the top end of the market, there's been no change. And if anything, there's a chance it's actually more competitive because funds are still out there with plenty of capital. They raised huge funds. They need to put it to work. And uh, when you're afraid, same thing as in the economy, when, when thing, people are a little bit afraid, they rush to quality, right? And so the best businesses have, frankly, more capital, I think, than even three months ago. Um, trying to funnel their way to them. So the hot deals, and so how do you, how do you define a hot deal? Uh, growth, number one, you know, so you're, you're at some scale, five, $10 million or greater, you're doubling year over year, you're, um, you're in a huge TAM and um, you have efficiency metrics that, that suggest to investors that there's a lot of demand out there for your product. You're a hot deal. You're you're going to get funded, um, and at some of these valuations, like 20x plus ARR valuations out there. So in some cases, far above that too. So um, I don't think the definition has really changed much. What I do think has changed is these businesses that are a little bit more nuanced, uh, especially more enterprise businesses that were more uh, highly impacted by COVID um, in in the end of Q1 and Q2 they're just not out there. They're either not looking for capital because they know that their story is a little incomplete at the moment, or if, or they're having a hard time raising capital. So if anything, I think COVID has exacerbated maybe an existing symptom we had in this industry of kind of the have not, the haves and the have nots, where um, if you're kind of, if you're suffering from COVID, I do think it is harder to get a deal done where people will tell you to wait. If you're not, it's a great time to be fundraising. Yeah. Maybe piggybacking off of um, that, I, um, I, I, I totally share Martin's view. And maybe I was thinking I probably put in put the situation uh, um, the environment in three buckets of companies. I would say the majority majority of companies are having a hard time raising. Um, I think you know generally investors have both pulled back the pace of capital deployment, which may have been an all time 20 year high in the last couple of years pre COVID, and then also people are still getting comfortable with doing a deal virtually from beginning to end. And so um, most of the deals are just ones where there's an existing relationship. And I would say on the earlier stage side, people have been slowly more comfortable with doing virtual deals. And I think those two combined means that, um, that, that there's still just like lower deal volumes. And, um, and so, and I think most companies fall in that bucket. Then you've got this, these two buckets of like one would be, I would call it maybe, blue chip or just kind of like brand reckon you know like high brand recognition companies whether it's early or most a lot of this um, growth stage that could have been you know negatively or up to neutral impacted by covid but it's an exceptional proven uh, management team that experienced pretty high growth pre-covid they're looking to raise more capital now for various reasons and they're absolutely still getting these rounds done sometimes you know hundreds of millions size rounds um but there might be more structure with that right like whether it's like a minimum threshold return for investors some some of the kind of like some of some of these terms liquidation preference etc that we're starting to see pop up that were kind of staples of the last couple of recessions are starting mm -hmm. to creep back and then the last bucket of what um Martin mentioned which like accelerated um, categories in COVID. So that that includes things like, you know, um, productivity, collaboration, absolutely. Um, I would say like pockets of infrastructure, um, technology, uh, software, then you've got, you know, gaming, oh. online food, um, and then some like some areas around social virtual events, like these are categories that where you're seeing 
spectacular growth during COVID and, um, you know, like far exceeding what they were experiencing pre-COVID. And so then in those categories, investors are thinking through, well, there's there may or may not be a reset of different magnitudes. And what does that behavior look like? For example, we actually look at a lot of data from China, for example, because they're just earlier in the cycle than we are to try to predict that um, that readjustment of behavior as we exit shelter in place. But there's gonna be a lot of differences because we are sheltered in place in the US, for example, but then also in Europe, far longer than some of the Asia countries were. So, um, and, and yeah, echoing Martin in these categories, I see valuations actually like as high or higher than previously. And there is a lot of competition because all of a sudden everyone is investing in these categories. And so these are companies getting like, you know, well upwards of 10 term sheets in these rounds that get done in a couple of weeks. So that's, I would say it's the third bucket that, uh, of what I see. Okay, great. And Joyce, I've got a, a separate question for you. I know you're mm -hmm. going to, but I, I wanted to uh, ask you a more difficult question um, uh, just to put you on the spot. So uh, we have a European audience. We have people that have joined from uh, Germany and London and other areas of the world. Um, you advise portfolio companies in Europe, some of those portfolio companies are looking to raise from US investors. Yeah. What advice are you providing them? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, I think one of the things that US investors uh, look for, which has changed a lot, and, and Amy and Martin will be able to provide some perspective on this in the last five years, is just the ability to prove growth outside of their core market. So if you're a company in, let's say, the Netherlands or Belgium, and you're targeting the Benelux, you want to see growth outside of those regions because you, you want to be able to prove that you are able to have go-to-market success out of you know, a culture that you're used to operating in. And so uh, historically, that has been growth coming from the U.S., I think more and more so it's growth across other parts of Europe. So it could be in Germany or France or, or Nordics or the UK. Um, but ultimately, you know, the business needs to look in a shape where there is some amount of predictability and, you know, proven unit economics in your core business, which is in your home market, and as well, strong momentum in, in new markets that you're expanding into. Um, so, uh Amy and Martin, um, there are a few funds in Europe that have some pretty funky terms. Uh, Amy had talked about uh, seeing uh, different pref preferences introduced to, into term sheets for those companies that might not be um, uh, in a hot space. As a U.S. equity investor, how do you deal with those situations where a European portfolio company is looking to raise and they've got some head scratching terms within their capital structure? What do you do? I can go. I can go first, Amy. I don't know if you want to. If you have strong opinions here, um, look. Structure at the end of the day is just a, uh, it's a technique used to bridge a valuation gap. Um, and so uh, I, I personally, I, I think honestly, we've done a bunch of deals in Europe. I don't know that we see a ton more structure in Europe than we see elsewhere. I think most of, you know, wherever these participating deals are, I'd love to see more of them. I'm, I'm not getting them. <laughs> Um, we're doing a lot of like plain convertible preferred deals. Um, so maybe, maybe I'm just, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not hunting in the right places, but I think ultimately structure is not that hard to figure out. You, the, the really important thing though, for an entrepreneur to know is an investor coming in, will take that structure into account. So if you have 20 million of participating preference from prior rounds, a new one will take that into account because that's $20 million that's not available to them and to other shareholders when the company sells. So I think as um, the, the place where entrepreneurs can get in trouble sometimes is they see their cap table and they think, okay, if I sell for $100 million, I own 30% of the company, 30 times 100 is 30. 
they really need to be cognizant of what actually happened to the waterfall at those different exit amounts mm -hmm. and really just make sure they're aware of those trade-offs when they agree to that structure up front um, because it feels good to get the high valuation at the when you get the round but there's there's a piper to, to pay down the road so I, I actually don't think we see huge issues with structure that we can't kind of just take into account when we're when we're pricing a deal or, or putting it around together and you don't worry about, uh, I guess this question would be for Amy, if there is structure, let's say that it's got like accumulating preferred or a three X preference. Do you worry about how that type of structure is going to motivate the, the management team um, or disincentivize them as you're looking at a deal? Does that impact your investment decision at all? Um, yeah, it's interesting because I, I agree with Martin that I think a lot of times the management team don't really understand the consequences mm -hmm. of those terms. It's not real for them because, um, yeah, it's, it's um, these kind of structure, it bridges the gap to valuation. And also, as you get later stage, is a way for a different type of investor to get downside protection. And obviously, you know, and that's and it's a perfect bridge because you know, founders are, um, and also early stage, earlier stage VC investors are very like rose tinted glasses view lens of like future company growth, which is a perfect way for a private equity style investor, I think, to come in with terms that protect them on the downside in the more likely sort of like probability zone of the exit for the company. And so I think a couple, and I think, you know, um, we, we do think about it a lot. Um, and I agree, we take into account like the structure, but, um, but I think founders should think about a couple of things. Ideally, you don't raise that kind of term sheet unless you need to and is at the later stage because it will absolutely um, make it harder for the next round of financing you do because it's just a lot of work that the next round investors will come in at. Either they're going to come in with equal or more structure or they're going to come in if you're raising because you have to, they're going to come in. Uh, knowing that pretty much all terms are on the table and they're going to renegotiate the prior preference stack. And so, which is a good amount, which is a, it's, it's fairly heavy lifting process. And so an investor might just say, well, I don't want to deal with this situation. Um, and, like in any case. And so in uh, any of those circumstances, it basically makes it harder for you to raise a future round. And so if you can prevent it, it's better to just raise it a lower valuation with cleaner terms, I think, than to raise it a higher valuation with, with, complex structure. Amen. <laughs> and, and I say that because I think investors, they theoretically make the same in both scenarios. So we should actually be somewhat uh, agnostic. But yeah, just, I've, I have seen structure cause some real issues as you get bigger because people's, uh, you know, incentives are misaligned. And um, mm -hmm. like the investors really incentives are misaligned. Exactly. Yeah. That, that, yeah. right. I mean, I remember a situation of a, a company that I, I inherited and was on the board of where essentially just the because of the way the fund, one of the earlier funds, the seed fund was structured previously because uh, it was a government backed fund. It caused implications further down the road and in future funding rounds where essentially there was a misalignment in the waterfall which would encourage an earlier investor to actually push for an earlier exit of the business and the later investors to push for a later investment of the business. And that's just something you don't want to have to manage um, as a founder. You want to make sure that, you know, there's always clear alignment across the board and across your shareholder base. Great. Um, so I'm not sure. I, I think you may have frozen up. Can you hear me? Oh, actually, I think we Scott, you may back. be frozen. Yeah, the story um, of my life. It, you have a still <laughs> I don't know if you can see um, Scott, but there were a couple can, of can, clearly you can hear. There are a couple yeah, of questions. I, I, there's um, a couple yeah. of questions. So the the first. Uh, for uh, I'll start with Joyce because I think that this is a a, a good question for you. Um, you know, Stefan was asking uh, in this market as an early stage company is now the right time to reach out to angels or seed investors to raise capital, or is there an alternative form of financing that you would suggest? What are you seeing in the European market? 
Um, you know, I think the short answer is it ultimately depends, you know, and what I when I say it depends, it depends on how big your company is and how fast it ultimately is growing uh, and what the shape of the organization looks like. I think where possible, um, I would postpone the fundraise until, you know, Q4, Q1 of this year, unless you absolutely need to go out to fundraise. Um, and the reason being is just that people have pulled back on uh, the investment pace in terms of new businesses. Um, you know, I think a lot of what you're seeing in the European venture community is a focus on really supporting um, the businesses that they've already invested into and doubling down on the winners into the funds. Um, with that being said, there has been, you know, a number of new funds that have just announced uh, in, in recent months. So those are the funds that will be looking for new investment opportunities because they need to deploy that capital. Uh, but ultimately, you know, I think as an early stage company, and again, it sort of depends on what scale you are at, um, the best time to really fundraise is when there is a little bit more stability and, and certainty in the market. Great. Um, and so I, I guess the, the, the follow up uh, question to that is um, actually comes from it. David, um, he'd like to understand uh, what do you think is a, a better form of capital to be raising in this market, um, debt financing or equity? Do you have do you have a sense based on what you're saying? Yeah, I would say if you are able to raise debt, um, which uh, the ability to raise debt ultimately also depends on whether you have supportive equity investors and VCs in your in your business, because most venture debt providers will uh, underwrite or they'll look to see who are the existing shareholders in your business, given that you are reliant on them for continued growth and, and funding, then it is an avenue that I would consider. Um, what I will say with that is that with with debt, what what it makes sense uh, to fund ultimately is your working capital. So you know the delta between um, when cash is coming into the business for your customers and when you're paying out salaries to employees within your, your company. That's a great use uh, of venture debt. The other one is really to fund predictable growth. So parts of the business that is proven. And ultimately, the reason behind that is you have to, you know, a, venture, a typical venture debt loan is, is like a mortgage on a house. So you need to pay the, the monthly interest and therefore you need to use cash inside the business as well as cash that you've raised from your um, your equity investors and that the ones that you're receiving from your customers to service that debt. So you need to have ability to really have a clear uh, forecasting and a clear cash profile in your business in order to actually service and pay the debt. Um, so ultimately I think, you know, from a cost of capital perspective, whether you're in early stage or growth stage or later stage business, the mixture of debt and equity is always going to be the, the most favorable. Great. Um, I can add Amy, a couple of things. That? It's actually interesting because um, maybe a question for Joyce is that I actually have always thought that you, the U S was the most lenient like venture debt, like market as like, you know, um, super clean terms um, compared to like every other market that could have changed uh, of late for sure. Um, I've looked at probably something like 50 debt term sheets in the last couple of months because one of our recommendations was that most of our portfolio companies just go out and like raise a line with a couple of really important criteria though is that um, we really wanted them to work with a bank first of all because a lot of venture debt funds actually are similar to the previous recessions. Um, their capital dries up on the LP side and then they actually can't, they actually don't honor um, um, term sheets that they have actually signed with our companies. And, and this is not uniform, but this has happened across our portfolio quite a few times. So that now we're like, go work with a bank. And for us, like we work with SVB, like JP Morgan, um, PacWest Bank, a number of other banks like, you know, that, that have U.S. presence um, primarily. Um, but then the other thing is just to like, I, I think the most important thing to negotiate out is covenants because um, of a couple of things. One you know, debt has to be paid back, right? Whereas equity, like you don't. Um, and so you, you're like on a time, essentially like a on a clock by, um, when you raise the debt. And um, the debt term sheets are often structured so that when you need it is when you actually hit your covenants. And so like if you're raising a debt <laughs> as a kind of like a rainy day insurance policy, but then 
but then you have essentially like a quick ratio or something like that, like in the covenant, then you will not be able to tap into that line of credit. And at that moment, the debt provider will be negotiating warrants and like all sorts of things with you when they're in absolutely a position of leverage. And so, you know, if you're in a strong position and you want to raise like to get some insurance, um, like capital, then make sure like that is more important to negotiate, I think, than almost any other term, you know, like um, warrants or like interest rate, et cetera. Um, and then if you are raising it in order to um, bridge yourself, like think about like where are you bridging to, like, you know, bridging to nowhere still means you've got to, you got to pay off the debt, the debt holder, your um, debt issuer before and everybody else. And so we've definitely been on the other side of the table where, you know, we've got frozen bank accounts and all sorts of stuff. And you really are kind of locked because um, you have a lot less recourse than I think if you have, if you're surrounded by a bunch of equity shareholders. So just understanding that and talking about that with your investors is pretty important. So I, I've got, I, I think we have time for one more question. Um, and I, I, I I think I've uh, saved the toughest for last. Um, so you're about to go and raise money. Um, for one reason or not, your existing investor doesn't want to participate in the next round or doesn't want to make introductions for you. How do you provide advice to that founder or the management team to navigate the fundraising process? Uh, Joyce, do, do you want to kick that off? Yeah, sure. So basically you're screwed. I'm just kidding. <laughs> throw it into there. Um, I think it's really important before you even raise a, fund, a funding round to really understand what is the strategy of a fund you know, what is their time horizon? What kind of returns are they looking for? How does the partnership dynamics work? What is the decision-making process that they go through? And ultimately also take into account, you know, if you have raised, let's say, seed or pre-seed funding, how the dynamics around the board are gonna look, um, especially when you raise a series A round and you have a formal board structure in place. Um, if you think about these things well in advance and really kind of do your work, research and do your homework and, and do referencing, you know, I always think anytime you consider taking on a term sheet, you should always speak to the entrepreneurs that the fund has backed, both the entrepreneurs that have had good exits, but and also the ones that have had, you know, not so good exits, then hopefully you don't get yourself in that situation. You know, if you are in that situation, then ultimately it's it comes down to a negotiation. Um, and what that means is you need to take into account, you know, what does the fund ultimately want? And and oftentimes what the fund is looking for is not just specific to you as a business, but just in the context of their overall business model. Um, you know, what, what are some of the other uh, incentives around the table? Um, ultimately, what is it that you want? Uh, what is it that you're both willing to walk away with? Um, and hopefully, based on a good understanding of that, then you can negotiate, you know, a, a, a interesting deal that that is beneficial for for both parties. Um, in some cases, it could mean that you know you simply just buy out the existing investor uh, because the relationship has has gone south and is is somewhat sour. I think generally most people have a price tag. Um, especially if you are, you know, an earlier stage fund that is looking to perhaps uh, fundraise in the next year or two, and you need to show actual returns to your LPs. So there's a lot of different ways in how you can navigate that. But ultimately, I think managing investor um, expectations is a continuous process that you have to do before, during, and after fundraise. Yeah, I great. And sorry, go ahead. No, please, Martin. Yeah, I, I, I'll keep it brief. Um, one, tell the truth. Tell any investors you're pitching for your new round exactly what the situation is, because they're going to find out anyway. And the investing world isn't that big, and we all know each other, and we're going to find out. So first step is tell the truth. And two, it's not, I don't think it's that big of a deal. I can tell you I've done plenty of deals in my career where not only have 
existing investors not participated, we've bought out existing investors. Like think about the signaling of that. Not only do I not want to put new money in, I, I'm ready to get out. And this isn't at a $500 million valuation. This is at a $100 million valuation. So um, I think good investors know that existing investors on a cap table don't always know what the future is going to hold. And it's one data point of many. Um, and I think the more upfront and transparent you as an entrepreneur are about it and say, look, I disagree. And, you know, whatever happened, happened, uh, the higher the probability you get to a good outcome with a new investor. Just to add to that, maybe I'll like change, like ch pivot a slightly yeah. instead of like be honest, maybe I recommend, um, control the narrative. Okay. It, like control the narrative because I mean, I think like if your existing investors don't participate or participate less than pro rata, there's typically two reasons. Um, one is that they're an early stage fund and they're just out of cap. Like, they, you know, they, they've got the allocation in and they can't actually participate further because they have a small fund. Or you have an investor that do do have a large fund and they don't have enough conviction in the company. And so they're not participating their full parada or further. And so like you need to basically control the narrative on those two scenarios. And um, and then and partic and I think it's particularly challenging for the latter one. How do you explain if you know you've got I don't know like Sequoia or like Excel on your board and they're not participating full pro rata? Like why is that? And um, you know some of the reasons might be that some of the narratives you might want to share might be anything from like we're not aligned on valuation or kind of like I want to bring on this type of investor to bring this particular type of value and I'm going to cut them down. So like th there's a lot of different ways you can you can communicate that. And so that's something that um, you should also probably coordinate with your existing investors and, and think through. Okay, great. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately for some of you, we've ran out of time. Um, I, I, I hope you all benefited. I, I certainly benefited. I'd like to thank Amy, Joyce, and Martin for your time. A really wonderful job. And thank you, uh, to the audience for your time and patience. Uh, I hope you enjoyed today's session. Our pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thanks, everyone, for Bye. joining Thank so you. late. Yeah, of course. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.